Let's do some scriptures this morning. Let us just talk so that it will be obvious that we are doing scripture. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer daring? You and I know that everybody that is dead is dead. He doesn't know what is happening around him. He cannot talk. He can even if you kick him, he will not retaliate. So if we are dead to sin, how are we still functioning with ease inside him? That's what the Bible is saying here. He said, knowing ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, somebody. So, if we have to understand the covenant of growing in grace, we have to be committed to engaging the fear of God as a lifestyle. We cannot fulfill our destiny in Christ without grace. And if we must live effectively in Christ, we must have the fear of God. Number two, be committed to walking in the newness of life if we must go in grace. Number, the, verse, the last verse we read said to us, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we walk, what? In the newness of life. What does new mean? New means something that has not been used before. Something that is not about to spoil. Something that is still fresh from the old. So you cannot be new and be acting like old. If this is an old microphone, from time to time we might be needing to fix it. It might have one issue or another. But if it's a new one, it should work free. So if a new microphone begins to behave like an old microphone, there is a problem. We have to be committed in working in the newness of life, knowing that old things have passed away. So, you cannot remain the old you. For it will be an error to put a new wine in an old wine skin. We all know what happens when you put a new wine in an old wine skin. If you put a new wine in an old wine skin, what does it do? It breaks. It gets busted. So, for us not to encounter a bust in destiny, immediately you become redeemed. You become committed to walking in the newness of life. Number three, be committed to a life of conscious yearning for the world. Hallelujah, somebody. A life of what? Conscious yearning for the world. Children of God, the entrance of his word does what? Brings life. By default, light dispels darkness. No matter how dark a place is, if light comes there, darkness does what? It goes away on its own. You and I know darkness is associated with all forms of horror. It is in the dark that thieves operate. It is in the dark in Nigeria. That's where kidnappers do better. It is <laughs> praise God. It is in the dark that, especially maybe you're driving in the night and your headlamps are not working. Sure thing, you will fall into the gully or something. So, when you have darkness in your path of destiny, there is no harm that destiny will encounter the dividends of grace. Because grace brings everything that has to do with joy, laughter, and ease. Listen to me. What you accomplish with ease 
is without fees, my God. If you see the labor you will put, you will be amazed. So, when you go for his word, the word brings in light. How does it bring in the light? It brings in light by you beginning to discover some scriptures that will make the work easier. How many of you know that there are some situations you will find yourself, a scripture will just jump up in your mind. And immediately you speak that scripture, there is a kind of peace that comes on you. How many of us have ever experienced such a thing before? The scripture just brings that peace. And you know that something, I remember many years ago, let me tell you a story. Many years ago, when I was in the secondary school, I think I was about to take my SSC or something like that. I was told that my liver had issues. But I gave my life to Christ, to the glory of God, and it struck with, with um, a fellowship called Scripture Union. Hallelujah. And um, then people were believing I'm a little bit fanatic. <laughs> Amen. But if you know scripture union, you will know that any scripture union member has to be fanatic. Amen. And so they said that something was wrong with my liver. And they were asking my father, why didn't you bring her in early? That it's a little bit too late. That we don't know if she would survive like three months or two months or then about or even weeks. But I'm sure you're guessing the outcome of the story because I'm the one holding my photo. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so this thing gives me what you call the migraine. If, if the pain starts, it's something. So they said that I should actually stop reading for SSE. That I shouldn't read. It would, it would increase whatever it was that was happening. And one night, my parents were sleeping. My siblings were sleeping. And I stood up from my bed and I sat on the table and I started reading. Remember, they said I should not read. So, as I was reading, all of a sudden, I heard Colossians 3 3. I looked around. I went out to the sitting room. I came back because it was a bundle. I didn't see anybody. I was afraid. I thought something was wrong. So I packed up all the books. I felt they said I should not read. Now that I'm reading, I'm beginning to hallucinate. So I closed the book first. And I went and I lay down on my bed. Immediately my head touched the pillow. I heard clearly again, Colossians 3.3. That's here, what I wanted to go on. Something in me said, what is this scripture? Why are you afraid? So I stood up. And I went to look for my Bible. I brought my Bible and opened it. Do you know what I saw? Because that was the day I learned that scripture till today. It said, your life is hid in Christ and Christ in God. Just seeing that scripture, I screamed. As I screamed, my mother ran out. My father, everybody, they said, what is it, what is it? And I told them that I'm healed, so nothing is wrong with me. Ah, my mother fell on the floor. She concluded, the thing has entered. Her brain. She's now mad. She started even recapping a dream that she saw me in the coffin. Ah, so that it will happen. Children of God, a week later we went back to the hospital and they were questioning the doctors. How did you arrive at this? As little as I was, I told them that it's not the doctor's fault that I was healed. Go for the word of God. You don't know when it will be coming hand. Go for the word. Do you know that you might be in a situation you don't know what to do? And you just speak the word of God and you'll be amazed. Instantly things will turn. Severally I have encountered that. Covenant steps to growing in grace. Number four. Be committed to a lifestyle of meekness. Be committed to a lifestyle of meekness. Children of God, meekness is synonymous to humility. When you are meek, there are doors that will never open to you that will just open to 
you on its own accord. It takes meekness to learn. It takes meekness to also keep learning. <laughs> when a believer is meek, his access to grace is unimaginable. The Bible made us to understand that Moses was the meekest man on earth. And guess what? Moses was a man that was talking to God face to face. And if you go to Matthew 5, he said that the meek will do what? Inherit the earth. I don't know what you're looking for on earth, though, but there is an easy way to assess it. Become meek. And the greatest scripture attached to that is said that the Lord resists the proud, but he gives what? Grace to the humble. Do you know one day? I was going through scriptures. And I saw that scripture again. The Lord resists the proud and resists. So just to check, I decided to look for synonyms of resist. I was going through the synonyms of resist. And I came across one of them. And I became very afraid. Do you know the one I came across? Another synonym for resist, man of God, is fight. So it means that the Lord fights the power. I say, my God, how many of you can fight God successfully here? So at times we find ourselves in situations that we cause for ourselves without knowing. There are some things that will be happening in your life. Child of God, check your pride level. And let me teach you something about pride today. Pride does not come overnight. Pride is the nature of the devil. We all know that pride was the thing that generated the reason why he was sent down. Pride is the nature of the devil. And one of the greatest weapons of the devil is subtlety. The devil will never come and tell you directly what he wants to do. He will go this way and come this way before he can tell you that's how he goes. Do you understand? So that's the same thing with pride. Pride will never come and say, I am pride, I have arrived. No. It will come gradually. For us ministers, I keep telling them how pride comes. You will pray, for example, and someone receives a miracle. Genuinely, you are actually blessing God. Lord, I give you all the praise for this miracle that has happened. Then a member at the back will just shout that he will give you one big name like that. He will call you um, uh, uh, talking wonders. Eh? You know? The God, <laughs> the God of my father. Talking wonders. As in, you, you, you didn't stop it then. So, Sunday so one, the God of my father. Sunday so two, as he look at you, the miracle happened. Sunday 3, as he cuts testimonies everywhere. By Sunday 4, if you're coming into the door and mistakenly somebody standing at the door did not come out, that is when we know if you're still the normal pastor or you have become the prime pastor. I don't know if you understand. Or you tell somebody to all, maybe someone even makes mistake. And so he was trying to fall. Pastor, please told me. Do you even know who I am? How can you be telling your pastor to hold you and stand you up? That's all. Your voice will change. Your style will change. Child of God, one of the secrets you should know today, none of us here has the capacity to eat praise successfully. The only person praise is sad. Is God. The more you serve in praise, the more grace filled your life becomes. The more humble you will remain. So, whenever anybody starts with all those sad types of storyline, you begin instantly as you're standing there to keep telling them all glory to Jesus. Hallelujah, somebody. Covenant steps. To growing in grace. Number five, 
Be committed to building your faith. Be committed to what? Building your faith. What is faith? According to scriptures, faith is calling those things that be not as though they are. So permit me to say that faith is let the weak say I am strong and let the poor say I am rich. Children of God, Bible says that faith cometh by how? Hearing. And hearing what? The word of God. Can I add to it a bit? Fear cometh by hearing. And hearing the stories of the world. Every day the television tells us stories. Things that are not proper, they tell it to us. Everything. Daily. So, you find out that all those things begin to make you fearful. And fear kills faith. Ah, they said a new policy came out. You will now lose your sleep. They said so, 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 and so thing is happening. You will lose your peace. That is not for members of our tribe. Scripture said something. He said the portion of Jacob is not like them. That is why you need to feed your faith with the word. That is why you need to also learn how to speak like our tribe member. Most of us here are Nigerians. But even though we are Nigerians, some of us here are members of the same tribe. So if you speak your tribe, your tribe member will understand you more than I will. Then if I speak my tribe, my tribe member will understand me more than you will. That means that every tribe has a language. I don't know if I'm communicating with someone. So the language of this tribe of ours is the language of faith. No matter what comes your way, you look at that thing and say to that thing, you will end in praise. I don't know if I'm communicating with someone. No matter what happens to you, you just look at the thing and you just, in fact, people around you should be weary of the way you talk. That is when you know you're talking and trying. They should be weary. Someone should come and give you an information before you even start talking. You say, it shall not stop. And you continue. Don't live a full day without speaking something that is attached to scripture. Don't live a full day. I, I, well, many years ago, I traveled and I went to Germany. So the bishop that came to pick me at the airport came with, you know, the way they used to. Uh-huh. So they came and they picked me. So they put me in the bishop's car and we were going. And both the audience, the bishop, everybody, they were now discussing. And they were saying, Nigeria is bad. Nigeria is this. Nigeria is that. Nigeria is the other one. And I didn't say a word. I kept quiet. And after a while, the bishop realized that I wasn't discussing with them. And he told them, he says to me, woman of God, you're not saying anything. <laughs> I said, I don't contribute to this type of discussion. He said, what? I said, yes. That the words that we speak, they are spirit and they are life. And that it is high time we stop speaking into Nigeria and expecting it to be what we are not speaking. That the U.S. we are all looking at, it is not better that some of the things that are happening there are amazing. But anybody talking in the U.S., by the time they finish, all you will hear is God bless America. How many times have you finished talking to a co Nigerian and say God bless Nigeria? So every day we say it's bad, they are thieves, they are rogues, and we expect them to be better than that. No! We call those things that be not as though they are. So we've called them, they are called. We should not complain. Do you know, the car was quiet until we go to our destination. They didn't talk to you. But you have to be intentional about the things you say. Wake up in the morning and speak to your day. Don't complain and complain and complain and God said, have you commanded the morning? Have you told the day sir, where it's supposed to be for? If you must walk, if 
effectively and sustain your grace level, child of God, you have to do what? Be committed to growing your faith. Praise the Lord. Hmm. Covenant steps to growing in grace. I don't know the number I am in now. Will be committed to a lifestyle of prayer. Number six. Thank you, ma'am. So number six. Be committed to a lifestyle of prayer. Hebrews 4, 6. Let's take scriptures again. You know, I'm trying to actually jump and jump and get done. Hallelujah. See, therefore, it remained that, sorry, Hebrews Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help in time of need. Prayer is one particular thing that is spoken of so much in Christendom but practiced so little. The way church is saved now, if we call a prayer meeting, you'll be amazed at how many people that will come. Hallelujah, somebody. And prayer is one thing that every religion do, including the native doctor beside someone. They pray. By the time they start chanting those incantations, it's prayer habit. The other religion pray. Other religions, in fact, some religions just sit in prayer for months and they pray. But we, now we are Christians, that is one thing so difficult for us to do. Jesus, that was grace personified, did not fulfill ministry without prayer. In fact, that was the thing he was doing that made him different from other disciples. You know, in his days, hmm, he had groups, the disciples were so much into him that they looked like him. How did I know? In fact, they looked like him, they walked like him, they talked like him, and they dressed like him. And I'll tell you how I knew that. Can you remember when he was about being betrayed? Huh? Do you know what the betrayer said? The one I kiss. If he didn't kiss Jesus, they would take another person. They would not identify Jesus. Why? Because they were now lookalikes. You know, even in Christianity today, you find out that in some commissions, most of the pastors look like the Jew. Even if the Jew will fry him, everybody will fry him. How many of you have noticed? Uh, they're actually trying to leave out Jesus and the disciples. But what was different? The disciples were looking at him, trying to be him, trying to do him. But they still found out that there was something different. And so they started monitoring him. After they monitored him so much, so they said we discovered it. They came to him, they said, Father, you know what, Rabbi? Teach us how to pray. They had learned every other thing. They have effectively copied every other thing. But it was remain one thing. And they had to go to him and say to him, teach us how to pray. And that was the only thing you would ever say that the disciples came together and asked for. The place of prayer as a child of God cannot be swept under. Prayer actually is communicating with God. If you say that God is your father and you do not pray, what makes him your father? Hallelujah, somebody. If you have a father, you don't talk to your father, you never go to your father, you don't do... What makes that person your father? Just say, I know this person. Not that he's my mother. Not that we have any relationship. Just say, I know. So we have to be committed to prayers. Jesus was a man of prayer. We too have to be people of prayer. How you differentiate between a powerful Christian and a powerless Christian is their prayer life. Let me give you a basic example. I'm sure that must have happened to one or two people. Maybe there was a time you became a Christian and you found out that you were not praying so much, so much, so much. So you sleep in the night and you feel as if something is pressing. How many of you have ever felt that thing? It's as if you are struggling. Then all of a sudden, 
you started praying and you keep praying. And you find out that that thing is no longer there, but you don't re- really notice immediately. It's after some time you'll be like, ah, this thing that used to happen to me does not happen for a very long time. How many of you have ever noticed such a thing? It is because your prayer level increased. So it simply means that the more you increase the prayer level, the more the devil runs far away. The more you keep increasing it, the more it keeps running away. Then, the wisdom in it is that that thing you did and it worked. If you continue doing it, it will continue working. And when working and working and working has worked so much, it becomes excellent work. I don't know if I'm communicating with someone this one. Covenant steps to growing in grace. Number seven. Be committed to a tireless and fruitful stewardship lifestyle. Whenever we come to this stewardship story, everybody begins to do as if they want to move back. Children of God. Stewardship is one thing in this kingdom that stands wrong. Stewardship is staying in service. In service of who? In service of God's kingdom and his interest. You can never serve God and actually regret it. In fact, at some point he said to them that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, what do you have to do? You have to be the servant of God. And in one scripture he now brought it up together. Because what does the servant do? The servant seeks the comfort of the master. The servant tries to make easy the work of the master. The servant is always available and interested in anything that has to do with the master. The servant has no excuse whatsoever if the master's command is involved. Am I making sense? I want scripture now showed us one secret. Matthew 6, 32. He said, seek ye first. The kingdom of God and all his righteousness. What did he say? Every other thing shall be added unto you. I don't care what you're looking for. I don't care what it is that is a pain or something that keeps you awake. There is a way to solve it without stress. Become a faithful steward. The place of faithful stewardship cannot be overemphasized. The day you become a faithful steward, the day life becomes easy for you. The day you become a faithful steward, the day you kneel down to pray and God answers before you finish praying. You know, there's a scripture that says that while they are yet praying, I would have answered them. It boils down on faithful stewardship. Hallelujah. Number eight. And I think that that's where I will begin to round it. Hallelujah. Be committed in growing your love for God. I'll round up with this place. I'll, I'll, okay, now I'll, I'll add one more if I round up. But this particular growing of love is a secret I discovered and life for me became very easy. Life for me became very easy. Now let me say something to you. As a child of God, there are some untapped resources we have. We don't really, we don't really make use of it. We just allow it, and so we find out that we suffer what we are not supposed to suffer. Things that are not supposed to be difficult become difficult. Am I talking to someone this morning? The easiest way, the easiest way for you to have anything happen for you with ease is to love God. If you read First Corinthians chapter number twelve. It talks about all the gifts you can ever de- desire. Even as a minister. It talks about desiring even the working of miracle, even uh, prophecy, this and that and that. Then, the last verse of First Corinthians chapter number 12 said, Yet, I show you a more excellent way. Then he jumped to First Corinthians and said, Do you know what he started talking about? He started talking about love. Everybody that ever loved God in scripture, they operated in a level of grace that was shocking. But the people 
that were in the grace dispensation and the people that were in the law dispensation. And I'll pick one, two or three of them so that we don't take a lot of time. Let me start with our covenant father Abraham. Children of God, at least I know that there are lots of people here that are married and some that are of marriageable age. So they will understand what I want to talk about. How many of you have been in love? New love? New one, not old one. <laughs> I like the way you're smiling. There's a difference between new love and old love. Take it from me. New love, eh? When you are in new love, no matter what they tell you, you will not hear. New love used to have problems with hearing. How many of you know? You also used to have problems with seeing. If you're in new love, for example, your female as a man has quarter past ten eyes, you will not see it. Even if they are telling you that the man is ugly, you say they are jealous of you. You understand? And the day you quarrel is the day you will see the eyes. How many of you have noticed it? Like, can you imagine? I was even managing years and years and So, that's the effects of new law. And what usually happens when new law happens is that when there is an opposition to new law, the first thing that comes to the mind of the people in love is to run away. How many of you know that? And in that process of running away, what do they call it? A low thing. Abby? Most of the people that try to elope, they just tell themselves, let's run away. Where are we going? We don't know first, but let's run. Now you understand where I'm going to. Abraham was operating in a place whereby the gods of his father was taught. And he now found this unknown God that nobody understands. And he now fell in love with this unknown God. And the people around him were wondering what was wrong with this man. The unknown God that he was in love with said, you know what? Run away. Am I making sense? So when Abraham was saying, I'm running, and they said, where are you going? And he said, no destination yet. People would have called him mad. But it was new law. Am I making sense? So, with new love, you will run without knowing the destination. It is when the love is old that your sense will begin to work. When your sense is working, if somebody tells you leave, you will ask, where am I going to? I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. That's how it works. But can I shock you? Everybody that loved him in that dimension turned out a wonder. When Abraham left in verse 12 of Genesis, by verse 13 of Genesis, he was very wealthy. He had it all working for him. He had it all in place. Nothing that was not in place. The love for God. You know, okay, let me come it all with a particular scripture. First Corinthians 2 9. Can we read it together? First Corinthians 2 9. First Corinthians. Listen to me. David was a man that also walked in that kind of love that Abraham had. David loved the Lord so much so that it was so difficult for God to see the challenges of David. So if you go and report David to God, what God will tell you is that he's a man after my own heart. Can I explain it for you? Eh? God will tell you David is my sweetheart. Simple. Or David is my heartbeat. How many of you call your spouse a sweetheart, heartbeat, all of them, heart, 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 sweet? That was what God himself said concerning David. David is a man after my own heart. So no matter what David was doing, and that was what made David have the tenacity to say to the prophet, let me fall into the hand of God. Because you cannot fall into the hand of your lover and he will deal with you without remembering his love. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. No wonder why scripture now said in 1 Corinthians 2 now. He said, eyes has not seen. Ears has not heard. It has not even been put in the heart of man what I have in store for death that love me. And I want to believe that why it is so is that our God is a lover. In fact, his next name is love. Bible like said that God is love. And the scripture that even children know, for God so loved the world that he gave. What 
God pushes people to do. What God did because of love was what Abraham did because of love. He took Isaac. He didn't bother. He didn't mind. He took Isaac for sacrifice. It's all. You can't love God and not operate in grace. Now let me put it down in a way that all of us will understand. How many of us here will somebody run in and say that they just slap your wife outside and you are still sitting there? How many of you here? Huh? You will run outside first to know who slaps your wife. It is when you get there and now see that he's a Goliath. That you say, ah, but why now? You shouldn't tell now. Don't you know she's a woman? Ah, he's a woman now. And he's slapping the woman. Praise God. <laughs> but the first thing you will do is that you will run outside. So know what happened. That's how he is. He's the groom and we are the bride. So it's a love relationship after all. So why it's so difficult for a lot of people to grow in grace is that they've not understood that it's a love relationship so they are not in love. And so he's looking for you to understand that I need intimacy from you. Growing in grace is possible. And that brings me to the last one I will take. Be committed to a lifestyle of giving. Now, can I say something? You cannot give when you don't love. You can't give. When you love, you give your time, you give your finances, you give your words. You understand? In fact, if you're a married couple and your husband does not talk to you for two days or something, immediately, for instance, you will say, he's not talking to me because I'm sure he has someone out there. That someone is talking to. So what even makes you pray is love. I, 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 am I communicating with someone? What brings you to the altar of prayer is love. What brings you to the altar of giving is love. Children of God, the best thing that can ever happen to any child of God, if you must grow in grace, is to love God and love Him with all your heart. Let's go on our feet. There's a song we used to sing in those days. If you know the song, you can join me, but if you don't know it, it's okay. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. Oh, loving you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. I want to love you, Lord. I want to love you, Lord. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. Now we sing it together now. Is this right? The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. Oh, loving you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. I want to love Capacity to love you. Capacity to love you. Capacity to love you. Deposit in me the capacity to love you. Deposit in me the capacity to love you. I want to love you, Lord. I want to love you, Lord. The greatest thing in all my life is love. I cannot hear your voice. Tell the Lord capacity to love you. That is all I ask. Capacity to love you. That is all I ask. Capacity to love you. Capacity to love you. To love you through thick and thin. To love you when it's working. To love you when it's not working. To love you morning. To love you noon. To love you in the night. Father, capacity to love you. That is what I ask. 
is all about you, Jesus. Father, this morning as a church, <laughs> give us the capacity to love you more at the rising of every sun. Let our love never wax cold. That capacity to love you, Father, give it to us. Lord, standing on the love you have given to us before we are required to return it to you. I decree and I declare that no one in compassion heart will suffer grace failure again. In the name of Jesus. For all the days of their life they will grow in grace. This Sunday will be the beginning of ascending to new realms of grace. In the name of Jesus Christ. New things will begin to happen for them with ease. In the name of Jesus Christ. The ground of Canada will yield to them. Unimaginable yieldings. In the name of Jesus, wherever the soul of their feet shall touch, it becomes theirs to possess. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, it will be well with them in the morning, well with them in the noon time, and well with them in the night seasons. Lord, we bless you. In Jesus' name.